2020 has been a hard year for public health. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected millions of lives around the world, and the social determinants of health in the United States are being put on trial like never before. The American Public Health Association is the largest and most influential yearly gathering of public health professionals, bringing the public health community together to take on these challenges. This is APHA-TV. I'm Dina Baer, and welcome to APHA TV. I'll be guiding you along as we begin APHA's first ever virtual annual meeting and expo. This is the official kickoff to the meeting. Join us for a day of networking, business meetings, and orientations. And we encourage you to explore the virtual meeting platform and expo. Enjoy early access to content such as posters and roundtable discussions and tune in to the California Endowment Racism Summit happening from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And now to talk with us about the California Endowment Racism Summit, let's catch up with its president and CEO, Robert Ross. Dr. Robert Ross is here now, a president of the California Endowment. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dina. Good to be with you. Talk a little bit about how race and racism play into the social determinants of health. Well, we now know that uh, race and structural racism are um, the starting points for the social determinants of health. The social determinants of health are profoundly structural and systemic in their orientation. Uh, they show up in public education. They show up in economic inclusion and economic systems. Uh, they show up in, in criminal justice and justice reform. Um, and they show up obviously in the health system. So the social determinants of health uh, have their roots in structural inequality and the roots of structural inequality are steeped in racial injustice, structural racism, and in particular, anti-black racism. So you can draw a straight line from structural racism to the social determinants of health Expand on the work of the California Endowment when it comes to the social determinants of health. Yeah, at the California Endowment, we've always been focused on the social determinants of health for quite some time. We focused on our 10-year Building Healthy Communities campaign, a $1.5 billion uh, multi-year campaign, uh, working with leaders in 14 economically distressed um, communities across the state uh, to do a frontal assault on the social determinants of health. Uh, make sure that working with community leaders at the grassroots level that are fighting battles in the justice system, in schools, in economic development and economic inclusion, and with the health system and mental health systems uh, to assure that system policies, system changes and policy changes are occurring so that we can have better conditions for vulnerable communities to enjoy health. Tell us a little bit about the California Endowment Summit. Racism is a public health crisis happening on the eve of APHA's annual meeting. Well, thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic and, and also with the uh, recent uh, law enforcement shootings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, uh, it has been made more clear that racism is a public health issue for this nation. So we'll be sponsoring uh, uh, more than one session, but one session in particular the role that structural racism plays in public health, uh, that, that racism, structural racism is a public health hazard, particularly anti-Black racism. Uh, we're going to be uh, having a session that will look at, for example, how we can redefine and communities can redefine and reimagine public safety as being more inclusive, more public health and prevention oriented, and get away from the cr hyper-criminalized, uh, hyper-incarceration uh, uh, framework uh, that has uh, defined public safety in this country. We need to have more of a public health framework for that uh, definition of, of public safety and make sure that it's more community oriented and takes racial equity into account. How is COVID-19 impacting the achievement gap among K through 12 students of color and what can the public health community do to shore up those gaps? COVID-19 has, has proven to be a dastardly foe on uh, public education as well. Uh, and not only are uh, the educational uh, achievement gaps being exacerbated by COVID-19, uh, but the health status of these young people and their families has 
particularly in social emotional health and mental health, uh, these kids uh, have less access and their families have less access to the kind of, of health and public health supports that they need. So COVID-19 has proven to be uh, quite the terrible foe in exposing structural inequality in our public education system. Every year on APHA TV, we identify and profile some organizations doing the very best work in public health. This year is no different. Let's begin by checking out the Global Infectious Diseases Institute at the University of Virginia. The Global Infectious Diseases Institute was founded in 2017. Our mission is to stimulate, catalyze, and support new interdisciplinary research on infectious diseases of worldwide significance and prominence and we try to foster interdisciplinary research by bringing together faculty from across the campus and a variety of disciplines. The Global Infectious Disease Institute uh, really tries to match new groups together. We need to get people thinking in different directions and so we have, we have brewing sessions which are engaged dialogue and, and facilitated uh, questions and interactions, solving problems they hadn't been thinking about before because we really want them working in new areas um, and then we'll have calls out for, for seed funding to help them get started in doing that. I think the COVID epidemic that we're currently experiencing has revealed to us that you can't just focus on science or medicine to solve this global problem. It takes all disciplines in order to tackle these notorious challenges. The Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Policy and Research was established 25 years ago with a grant from the Joyce Foundation. The mission of our center is to reduce gun violence in America and promote justice and equity. A foundation of our work and our ability to have impact is really based upon the scientific rigor of our research. Prior to the mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary in December 2012, there was very little public uh, opinion information on gun policy, but in, in reality, there was really just an information void. I'm very proud of the work of Johns Hopkins and our center for being able to step in and begin a, a rigorous research uh, approach to trying to better understand the contours of public opinion on gun policy in America. Welcome to the APHA 2020 Annual Meeting and Expo, our first all-virtual annual meeting. Just like our in-person meetings, this virtual meeting is a mix of poster, roundtable, and oral scientific sessions, plus networking and engagement events. To make sure that you don't miss a minute of the action, let's go over some of the basics of our easy-to-use annual meeting platform. Right now, we're looking at the meeting homepage. You should bookmark this page for the week for quick access. Be sure to read the important information on this page. First, we need to sign in. You can sign in by clicking the Sign In button. It appears at both the top and left side of this page. In order to sign in, you need your registration ID and the email address associated with your registration. If you've already registered but don't know where to find this information, you can send yourself a copy of your confirmation. And if you haven't registered yet, you can do so by clicking Register Now in the box. Enter the information and click Sign In. Don't forget that APHA is very active on social media. Follow APHA and hashtag APHA2020 on your favorite platforms. Include the hashtag in your posts to be part of the conversation. And if you run into any trouble during the meeting, don't hesitate to drop by our help desk. We hope you enjoy your stay at the APHA 2020 Annual Meeting and Expo. Whether it's groups that are marginalized because of their documentation status, because of their race, because of their sexual orientation, everything that we do is geared towards enhancing their right to health. 
without data and without actually pushing for change, that change will probably never happen. And so having access to research, having access to a good department like ours is absolutely critical to improving the health status of people everywhere. We have faculty that are social scientists, faculty that are epidemiologists, lawyers, and so that inherently injects an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary lens in the research approach. The department has never been more robust and our students have never been more enthusiastic. We see ourselves as partnering with the community to make change and improve health outcomes. I'm the director of the Center for Health Equity at the Louisville Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness. Our mission is a Louisville where everyone in every community thrives by expanding our reach uh, when it comes to advancing health equity across our community. Racism is a system that concentrates power for some by concentrating scarcity for many. So racism is fundamentally depressing the quality of life for all of us and reducing our ability to experience joy and wellness uh, because our systems are designed around unfair power. The Center for Health Equity tries to advance health equity in a few ways. We analyze data to be able to tell the story. We try to support our partners, and then we really try to help shape a worldview for people that says we do deserve better. I have the great pleasure now of being joined by APHA President, Dr. Lisa Carlson. Thank you so much, I'm so happy to be here. Tell us about your year as president during this public health crisis we find ourselves in. Yeah, wow, I mean, what a year uh, to serve as APHA president. Uh, I knew that this would be the most tremendous honor of my career before we had the greatest public health challenge in a century. Uh, so really it's been, it's been quite a year uh, to do this. The, the job is really different than I expected. Uh, generally, what our APHA presidents do is travel the country and visit our affiliates and be part of their annual meetings. I had a lot of those trips scheduled for the spring, and not surprisingly, um, they were canceled. Um, so there was a little bit of a lull there trying to sort of figure out how we'd regroup. I, I spent a lot of time uh, doing press interviews uh, and uh, uh, virtual interviews. And then our affiliates really regrouped and are a lot of them having fall virtual meetings. So in some ways, much of my presidential year is happening right now. I'm talking to a number of our affiliates in October and November. And to me, that's really emblematic of 2020 as a whole. I mean, we haven't yet had the time yet to pause and reflect on the year because we're still living through it anew every day. And I feel a little bit like that's what the presidential year is like. I'm, I'm having sort of a rush of the year all right here at the end. Can you talk a little bit about how public health experts and the APHA have been sounding an alarm about the social determinants of health well before COVID-19 even hit? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that public health was not naive before COVID. Uh, we knew that social determinants impact health. We knew that uh, Americans had pre-existing conditions, that they had little to no uh, savings, that they don't have a national paid sick leave. And we have a society at risk. We're really fueled by social structures like income inequality or the coupling of health insurance with employment, structural racism. I mean, we've been sounding the alarm that we know the fact is inequity kills. And so APHA has been really active in sounding that alarm long before the pandemic. And I think these issues have really only been laid bare by the pandemic and magnified in such a way that those realities are much harder to ignore. I understand you've been encouraging people to spend more time outdoors. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, I do. I think one of the inequities I care a lot is about inequity in green space. And it's another one of the things that really became apparent in the pandemic. So early in the, in the pandemic, when we locked down and we told people to stay safely indoors, but to get safely outdoors, it became apparent quite quickly that not everybody has access to safe green space near their homes. And so some cities, uh, they closed their streets. And so they gave people a safe place to get outside and, and keep their, their physical distance from each other and really applaud that kind of thing because we know that people are more likely to report good health and well-being if they spend 120 minutes a week in nature, which doesn't sound like a lot, but people spend about 90% of their time indoors. And that was before the isolation caused by the pandemic. 
So I think that right now nature is really a place where we can get respite and and get out into the trees to restore our spirit and 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 be part of that sort of physical and mental mental health exercises that we need uh, to keep us uh, mentally and physically healthy. Mental health has been a huge issue in this pandemic. It's also a huge part of your message. Talk about it. Yeah, you know, I was talking last year about what I wanted to think about when I was out in our affiliates this year, and I knew I wanted to talk a lot about mental health being essential to public health. And that was before the pandemic. So if you think about it, in an average year, one in five U.S. adults struggles with poor mental health, which means that most of us know somebody who has struggled. But I think you could argue that in the pandemic, everyone knows someone who's struggling if they aren't struggling themselves. And so this is really a particularly critical time to acknowledge the impact of mental health when talking about COVID-19. So every time we talk about COVID-19, every time we talk about public health, we should talk about mental health. And I also want to acknowledge that public health workers themselves are struggling right now. This is, as I said, the greatest public health crisis in a century. And so I want to encourage people to take care of themselves and take care of each other. And we can do that with simple things by on our own, like going back to the basics, getting plenty of sleep, getting plenty of rest, uh, eating well, making sure we get outside uh, and get a fair amount of exercise. Well, all those things are important, but we also wanna take care of each other. And I mean that both in terms of you and your colleagues asking if people are okay, if they need to take a break, but also sort of writ large in how we think about promoting mental health and being part of those conversations. I think public health is the right group to convene conversations about mental health, to have those cross-sector discussions. What do you see for APHA moving forward and what tips do you have for the incoming president as we continue to move through this pandemic? Yeah, I think the most important thing I wanna say about where we are and where we're going right now is thank you. I think that the public health workers who are on the front lines right now, who are fighting the good fight of public health, I think probably aren't hearing enough thank you. And so I wanna just say APHA is here to support you and to advocate for you. I think our greatest strength is in our membership numbers that we bring to bear when we advocate with legislators. And there has never been a more important time to be part of that movement. In a whole generation, there hasn't been a more important time than right now. That's it for us today, but remember, we'll be back each day of the virtual meeting with more exclusive material. And don't forget to keep up with all the latest developments and get in touch with us via the web. We'll see you tomorrow.